I chose 35 of the world's last, remotest, untouched, aesthetically beautiful tribes and cultures in 35 of the world's most diverse geographical locations and off I went on a journey. What we see today is the first third of this project. The second third will be returning to all these people I photographed and giving back what I made because I've essentially taken something from them. I want to give it back and start a communication with them. Who are you? Who are we? Why are you significant? What can you learn off us and what can we learn off you whilst you evolve and develop into the developed world? And then part three is another 35. And those are 35 which I will need more status and a bigger name and a more of an authority to get access to because governments are either protecting them or they're deterring people like me from visiting them. The true challenge is communication. How do you communicate with these people? How do you communicate with them on a superficial level? But then how do you communicate on a deep level in wanting to make these photographs? If you imagine there are 7,000 official languages in the world, of each language there are 1,001 other dialects. So if you take a translator with you, the chances are that he only speaks a few words of the real language of the people you get to. So it's ultimately up to me. So you're jumping in the deep end. But that, in actual fact, is what it's all about. If you dare commit, if you dare become vulnerable, if you dare metaphorically strip off and get in there, if you dare take a very old, 50-year-old technical camera and a tripod and plate film and be on your own, well, in the case I had a cameraman with me, you have to go to the very source of how people communicate with one another. And that goes far beyond language. It goes into touch, it goes into body language, physicality, your eyes, it goes into emotion, laughter, crying. I had many physical accidents because I couldn't actually cope with what I was doing. I was on the limit of my physical capabilities. And in that way, you re-communicate on a human basis. Who are we as human beings? It's, if you have a translator who literally speaks that dialect and if you have a digital camera, first you don't bother getting out of your car or a vehicle or getting off your horse because you keep the distance. Secondly, you let somebody else do the communication for you. So you never really get into the subject matter. There's um, a picture of three Kazakh warriors on the Altai Mountains, these fantastically beautiful people with their eagles with five meter large wingspans. And I persuaded them to come up on top of a mountain, the Altai Mountains, with me very early in the morning to catch the light with this amazing vista behind. It took me three mornings. The first two mornings, there was no sunrise. So I had to persuade them, we're going down again. The image is flat. They don't know what photography is, but we've already got on this communication. For the third morning, we go up on top, top of the mountain. And there we're standing. We're standing in front of an image I've dreamed of as a photographer, making the whole of my life with this infinite view of these mountains and the snow and ice these three glorious horses with these men dressed in the most fantastic outfits with these eagles on their arms. It's minus 30 degrees and the wind is blowing and it's cold. There I am and in my excitement I take off my gloves and go for my camera. The camera is an old plate camera and the lens is on a sheet metal and my fingers stick to the sheet metal. I pull them off in my panic, I break the fingers and they're frozen. So I start crying, I start sobbing, I sit on the floor because I can't function. I'm, I'm livid that in front of me is the, the picture I've dreamed of making my whole life and I can't function. So I'm sobbing and I'm sobbing and I'm sobbing. I get up and I jump up and down. In the meantime, the Kazakhs are sitting there on the mountain, proudly waiting for the light to come, waiting for me to come and make the picture. And I turn around and two of the women had followed us up the mountain. And one of them beckons me over and I stumble over this sort of flailing, crying child. She opens her jacket, grabs my hands and puts them on her chest. The other woman opens me and hugs me from her and they rock me like a child. And I let go and I spend the better part of three or four minutes in their, in their, their, in their cradling. And they hum to me something I don't quite remember. I eventually regained some feeling in my fingers. I turned around very selfishly, went immediately for my camera and made the picture. The guys were still standing there. But it wasn't until we'd finished this process and we started walking down the mountain that I began to realize this, this is an Islamic culture. This is a culture where we are told is distant, we are told is judgmental, we are told is... And because of my utter, utter uh, fallibility, my flailing uh, uh, physicality, they decided to abandon all their rules and regulations to say, well, we're going to help him. Why? We don't know, but we feel he needs our help. Because they didn't get a picture from me, they haven't seen the pictures yet, I didn't pay them for it. But they took me in on a human basis and by pushing myself into that vulnerable situation, you end up connecting. And I think the, the, the moral behind the story is, is if you dare come close, you dare become fallible, wherever you are and whoever you are, you can make some form of human connection. And the icing on the cake of that human connection is making these pictures with this large-scale camera, these pictures of dignity and pride and hopefully beauty. 
majority of the people weren't necessarily aware of what the camera was. They have no form of documenting or their, their being. So this whole idea of stealing their culture in a photograph, when, when they never had photography in their culture in the first place, where did that come from? I think it, there are one or two cases where it may be true, maybe in the Aboriginal culture in Australia, but there again, that is an imposition because they've never had cameras or any form of making a, a physical representation of themselves. But the majority of the people were unaware of what a camera was and unaware of what a picture was. What they were aware of was me uh, uh, worshipping them and praising the, their vanity. And the more you did that, the more small you became, the more you put them on a pedestal, the more you played with their face to get the light, the more you fiddled with the reflectors, the more you waited till the, the rainbow came the more power they felt in their presence and the more they loved it. And often you would arrive in a village and people weren't necessarily aware and you'd look around the group and you'd find one person you'd make eye contact with and then you'd get him sitting down you'd start playing with the camera and before you know it, the whole village would come and then the inverse would happen. They wouldn't let you go until everybody had sat on that chair and everybody had had me touch them and raise the chin and turn it to the left and turn it to the right and put that film in the camera. 